A man, smartly dressed, softly spoken, is sitting in seat 18C as his Boeing 727 Flight 305 taxis down the runway. Calmly, he slips the good-looking flight attendant a note. Oh no, not again, she thinks, assuming it's just another phone number from a lonely businessman. She folds the note and puts it in her purse, whereupon the man confidently informs her, Miss, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb. One question is, did he? But the bigger question is, after this gentleman air pirate got the ransom money he asked for, what happened to him? How did the man that became known as D.B. Cooper just disappear and maintain his disappearing act forevermore? Or was he one of the suspects we'll talk about today? First, you'll need the details of the crime. It was Thanksgiving Eve, November 24, 1971. A man told staff at Northwest Orient Airlines counter at Portland International Airport his name was Dan Cooper. How he became D.B. Cooper was a matter of a communication breakdown, but suffice to say, we very much doubt he was a Dan or a Cooper. Reservoir Dog style, he was neatly dressed in a black suit with a black tie and a pressed white shirt. Later staff said he was probably mid-40s and of average build. Sometime in the mid-afternoon, the plane left Portland with about one-third of the seats taken. That was ideal for Mr. Cooper. He got himself a bourbon and let the flight attendant know that he'd written down a lot more on that note than a phone number. The flight attendant was Florence Schaffner, who was soon joined by a newbie named Tina Mucklow. It was Mucklow who immediately informed the pilots that they had a bit of a situation on their hands. She said there's this guy in a black suit back there, wearing horn-rimmed glasses, saying he has a bomb. At the same time, Mucklow took a seat next to Cooper and he opened his briefcase for her. To her dismay, when he did so, she thought she saw eight sticks of dynamite connected to two wires and a battery. In his hand, he had a trigger. She was told in no uncertain terms, albeit in a very polite way, that he wanted $200,000 in cash, two front parachutes and two back parachutes for when the plane landed in Seattle. He also demanded that when they land there, there should be a fuel truck waiting. It was Mucklow who then became an intermediary for the hijacker and the rest of the plane's crew. Many years later, in an interview, she said, I was there for the hijacker to kind of keep him feeling safe, reassured, comfortable, and not detonating that bomb. When she got a moment to herself, she prayed, not just for herself, but for everyone on the plane, including the hijacker. That flight should have only taken about 30 minutes to reach Seattle, but the plane circled in the skies for close to two hours as the government agents decided what to do and got the things together for the hijacker. The other passengers at this point had no idea what was going on and were told that the plane was having some mechanical problems. All the time, Cooper seemed unbelievably calm, pointing out of the window at places he saw down below. Mucklow later said he seemed rather nice. He was never cruel or nasty. He was thoughtful and calm all the time. He even ordered another bourbon and paid for it too, not that he really needed to. It was then that Mucklow picked up the courage to ask him why he was doing this and did he have some sort of grudge against the airline. Cooper responded, I don't have a grudge against your airline, miss, I just have a grudge. That grudge will soon become a big part of the story, don't forget about it. When the plane landed, Cooper got his money in unmarked $20 bills, each of them having been filmed first. He also got his parachutes, but declined them because they were military parachutes. He didn't have to wait too long before he got civilian parachutes. All the passengers still ignorant of what was really happening were released. The plane just sat there, all of its window shades closed to prevent snipers from firing inside. Now Cooper had what he wanted. He also let Schaffner and another flight attendant go, although Mucklow was told she'd be staying for the next flight. As the plane was being refueled, the authorities asked to talk face to face with Cooper, to which he of course replied with a resounding no. He added, let's get the show on the road. The authorities had been busy trying to stall the refueling, but the plane went up in the end. Cooper told the pilots their destination was Mexico City and they should travel at the lowest speed possible, about 115 miles per hour, and not go above 10,000 feet. He also demanded that the wing flaps should be lowered to 15 degrees and that the cabin had to stay unpressurized. He had, of course, figured out how he might jump safely, although as you'll see, safety was almost impossible. It was then that he had a bit of a setback, when the first officer told him that there was no way they'd get all the way to Mexico City and they'd have to refuel again on the way. Nevada's Reno Tahoe International Airport was chosen and Cooper along with Mucklow stayed in the cabin and waited. Years later, Mucklow said, I think the one feeling that was forefront in my mind was I just felt so alone. It was her again who would deal with Cooper directly before the jump. He had told the ground staff that he wanted to fly with the exit door open and the stairs down, but that, they said, was just too dangerous, so when the time came to jump, he asked Mucklow to help him with the door and stairs. In the end, he just told her to go to the cockpit. He'd do it himself. She looked at him in a painful tone and said, will you please, please take the bomb with you? He either didn't hear her or ignored her, still fiddling with the parachutes. There, she left him, the last person ever to see the gentleman hijacker. She just hoped that when she got back to the cockpit, they'd all be safe. 
The pilot later recalled, all of a sudden the cockpit door opened and in walked this lovely lady who had been our passive resistance to the hijacker. No sooner than the door opened, Cooper was hit by the wind. It was noisy and hectic, and he couldn't get the stairs down. Using the intercom, he told the pilots the problem. Over the howls of the wind, they told him they'd slow the plane down for him. It worked, and soon Cooper left the plane. The same pilot sat with Mucklow in the back of an FBI car once they landed in Reno. She cried as she'd never cried before. The pilot turned to her and said, it's okay, it's okay, it's over. It was over. No one had died or even had been injured, but that plane was missing a few things. Cooper, the money, and the bomb. The FBI released composite sketches of the guy they were calling Cooper. They had fingerprints, they had some of the parachutes he hadn't used, they even had his clip-on tie and tie pin. As for how he got the name D.B. Cooper, cops looked into a man right at the beginning of the investigation named D.B. Cooper. There was no way that it was him, but an eager reporter used the name, and that hit the newswire, and well, the name stuck. Experts soon chimed in, saying parachuting over that particular area in the dead of night was a perilous thing to do. Not even some of the best parachuters in the world would be foolhardy enough to try such a stunt. But whoever Cooper really was, he obviously knew his stuff. Not at any point had he seemed worried. D.B. Cooper could have been a real-life action man. We'll come to this later. He'd obviously left the plane, there was no doubt about that, but the Air Force F-106 pilots who'd been in the sky that night had seen nothing. Not a man or a parachute. Still, in the darkness and moving at that speed, it was unlikely they'd have seen him. Not even their radars had picked up anything. Then there was the question of where he'd landed. Figuring that out was no easy feat. When a person jumps from an aircraft at that speed, it's almost impossible to know where they'd land, given they had no idea where he'd pulled his chute. Dressed all in black, flying through the night sky, he was pretty much invisible, and once he hit the ground, he could use the darkness to make his getaway. On top of that, if he had died during his escape, well, there would be a body, wouldn't there? Had that bag, containing $10,020 bills flown off into the sky, it would have landed someplace. Perhaps it might have opened, and those marked bills would have gone flying around like dandelions in the wind. But they found nothing, including the bomb. The one great lead cops got was in 1980. A young boy had been playing at the side of the Columbia River just north of Portland, and he discovered some $20 bills. Not the entire stack, but $5,800, which is a fairly significant amount. Had Cooper just lost some of the money? We'll come back to this, too. You can bet that folks were out in numbers for days, weeks, months, even years, hiking around the area looking for what they believed was a fortune. The FBI recreated the event using a sled instead of a human and pushing it out of the plane. Their conclusion was if Cooper had safely landed, he'd landed in pretty unforgiving territory. A man could certainly go missing for many years in that rough terrain. Still, they searched and searched and visited just about every house they could. They flew aircraft over the area, had helicopters doing regular searches, and found nothing, not a body or even a scrap of clothing that could be his. Winter came and went, and when the snow thawed, the Army, the Air Force, the National Guard, police, and civilians mounted a huge search over areas where Cooper should have landed. They even used a submarine to search one of the lakes in the area and again found nothing. What they did find was a skeleton, and that turned out to be the remains of a girl who'd been abducted and murdered. The only person who ever really got close to Cooper was Mucklow. But after being interviewed by the FBI, she just wanted to forget the whole ordeal. It didn't stop civilian sleuths from hunting her down and turning up at her door. They thought, somehow, she must have known something. She might have even been involved. She later said, I went on with my life, pursued what I needed to do, and had my own personal interests, likes, and wants. I wasn't defined by that hijacking. Still, every year, people would turn up at her door asking questions. She knew nothing. She was certainly no part of the hijack. So without any sign of a body, the cops went in search for the money scouring casinos and other places where they might have been spent in an act of laundering. They offered a reward of $25,000 to anyone who could return the cash, but until that kid dug up some of it, none of the bills were ever found. In 1978, the authorities came across some more evidence. A deer hunter had been out and about in a rural part of Washington state when he found a card with instructions on it. Those were instructions on how to lower some stairs on a Boeing 727. It was thought they belonged to Cooper, with the discovery being made in an area where the card could have landed from that plane. As you know, then some of the cash was found. It was also discovered in an area of concern, but some things about the money just didn't make sense. How come some of the bills from one packet were missing? How come three packets all stayed together after being separated from the rest of the cash? Then, many years later, scientists said that the money hadn't fallen into the river after the hijacking, but had gotten there many months later. How had it made its way there? Bundles of cash don't tend to move well on their own. But if Cooper had survived, how did that money get separated? The authorities even dredged the river, but they didn't find one more bill. Civilians kept digging even when the authorities had stopped. One of them, Eric Olis, spent a decade looking for that money. He also came up empty-handed, but when asked in 2021 
what he thought about the case, he said with confidence, I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that he survived. This is why many people kept annoying Mucklow for all those years. Much of the public does not believe D.B. Cooper is dead. If he was dead, his body would have been found, or at least some of his belongings would have been found. Cooper knew what he was doing. He may not have been a consummate professional, but he had a plan, and his nonchalant attitude in the plane certainly tells us he knew something about flying and parachuting. It's also likely that the man who committed this crime would almost certainly have committed other crimes. These are the things we know for sure. Cooper was almost certainly 5 foot 10 inches tall. He had dark hair, tan skin. He likely weighed about 180 pounds. He was in his 40s. He also had brown colored eyes. He'd been seen up close for an extended period of time, and so we're fairly certain about all this. We also know due to the things he said to Mucklow that he was very familiar with the Seattle area. He knew certain spots from the sky, and with his parachuting know-how, this has led people to think he might well have been an Air Force veteran. On top of that, he used the name Dan Cooper, who is actually a comic book Air Force hero who did fictional crazy stunts for the Royal Canadian Air Force. These comics, though, were not available in the US, so the theory is Cooper might have read them when he was doing a tour with the Air Force in Europe. The comic theory might just be a coincidence, but in this case, nothing can be ignored. It just makes sense that Cooper had experience flying and parachuting. The reason he asked for more parachutes was cunning. That was, he knew if he asked for one, he might have been given one that didn't work. Since he asked for four, that made the authorities think he was going to force someone to jump with him, so they couldn't risk giving him a faulty chute. He chose in the 727 because he knew it was an ideal one to jump out of, and he understood that it could be refueled very fast. He also knew the stairs could be lowered during the flight, something that we regular folks would never know. In short, Mr. Cooper knew that plane inside and out, and he was well aware of how and when to jump and where he'd be landing. He might have even known that around the time the CIA was secretly using 727s to covertly drop its guys during the Vietnam War. So, he could have been a well-trained military man with extensive knowledge of flying. Psychologists have also said that with such a high-risk plan, it's also very likely that the fellow that committed this crime was in some serious debt. With all this in mind, you'd think he'd have been pretty easy to find. Let's now see who fit the bill for the Cooper identity. One of the suspects was Dwayne L. Weber, and he certainly looked like the mystery man. He had spent time in prison and had been in the army. He also chain-smoked, and his booze of choice was bourbon. There's something we need to tell you here, too. As for the smoking, you could do that on commercial aircraft back in those days, and it seems Cooper did it with confidence. Mucklow had to light his cigarettes for him because one of his hands stayed on the trigger of the bomb at all times. So you'd think the FBI would have a load of finished smokes, and they did. But they lost them, and years later, the agency said they had no idea where they were. That's such a pity, because once DNA profiling became a thing, those tabs could have pointed us to the identity of the hijacker. Moving on, on Weber's deathbed, his kidneys failing him, he turned to his wife and told her that he was the man who jumped out of a plane with a bag full of cash. With not much life left in him, he uttered the words, I am Dan Cooper. He then died. His wife, somewhat surprised by his deathbed confession, later went through his things. What she found shocked her. She found not just one false ID, but a bunch of them. She later said she spent years investigating the possibility that her husband was Cooper. She believed his confession, saying she remembered him having nightmares about leaving fingerprints on the plane. She also remembered him one day around the time of the hijacking coming home with a knee injury. To add to this, a library book on Cooper was found with Weber's handwriting in it, and his wife can recall that one day he took her to where that kid found the cash. It's her belief that he hid the money, but some of it was damaged, so he threw those three bundles into the river and they ended up on the sandbank. She even found an old Northwest Airlines ticket. Still, while this all looks like solid circumstantial evidence, it's certainly not enough. The FBI investigated, but Weber, while being a bit of a secret criminal, just didn't look like the man. The agency did have some DNA evidence from the tie pin, although they admitted it was difficult to draw firm conclusions from the samples. What evidence they had just didn't match Weber's DNA profile. We should also add that the FBI is not 100% sure that the fingerprints they have are the ones of the hijacker. Another person who has been in the spotlight was L.D. Cooper, a Korean War veteran with a shady past. His loving niece was featured in a documentary about Cooper, saying she knew without a doubt her uncle was the man that hijacked the plane. Let's just say here, there were 900 suspects in this case and a handful of people have said they have no doubt they know who the hijacker was. The niece said she recalled one Thanksgiving meeting with her uncle in the woods and he was covered in blood. Her other uncle, Dewey Cooper, then said the words, well, we did it, we hijacked the airplane. L.D. Cooper then went missing, and it wasn't until years later that his niece was told that the reason for his swift exit from the family was the fact that he was on the run after doing the hijacking. Nonetheless, she can't really offer much more evidence than the fact that she says she was told all this. 
She'd even been a bit tetchy with the journalists who tried to talk to her about it. There's also evidence that LD didn't just disappear and had in fact stayed in touch with the family until his death in 99. The journalist discovered that he had indeed moved away and gotten married. He apparently spent the last years of his life at a ministry run by a guy who was helping ex-convicts. So yes, he certainly had a mysterious life and when you listen to the niece it's easy to join the dots, but we still doubt that LD Cooper was DB Cooper. Then there's the compelling story of Barbara Dayton whose name at birth was Robert Dayton. In 1969 she had a gender reassignment surgery, and the story goes that when she hijacked that plane in 1971 she dressed up as a man. This kind of clothes switch was not new to her, having been fond of wearing girls clothes when she was still a boy. As for hijacking expertise, she'd been a merchant marine, had experience blowing things up with dynamite as a kid when working with her father, and in adult life she loved nothing more than doing some pretty hair-raising parachute jumps. Dayton also got a license to fly planes in 1959, but then, still identifying as male, he failed to get what he really wanted which was a commercial pilot's license. He failed the maths part of the test on two occasions and undoubtedly was quite upset about it. Now cast your mind back to the actual hijacking. When Cooper told the flight attendant that he didn't have a grudge against the airline, but did have a grudge against something. He was also turned down by Johns Hopkins University when he asked for gender reassignment surgery but managed to get it later at Seattle's University Hospital. There are two possible grudges. This is hardly cogent evidence, but just before the hijacking she went back to the hospital for a checkup and the doctors noted she was very depressed and one of the reasons was cash or a lack thereof. Then when she went back after the hijacking the doctors noted that her mood had greatly improved. It's still pretty weak in the evidence department. There's more though. She lived in the area of the hijacking so her friends would often talk about it. What those friends later said in interviews is interesting. They said she got mad when anyone criticized the hijacker and then one day just admitted that she was D.B. Cooper. Their story says that she was depressed and so decided to do the heist. She dressed in a suit and put nail polish on her hair to make it dark. She then put together a bomb and later did the job. As for how she survived a perilous jump, she said she navigated through the sky using illuminated checkpoints. After landing, she ditched the cash and walked away, changing back into her woman's clothes. This made for the perfect getaway because no one was looking for a woman. It seems in later life she wasn't so chatty about her deeds, although this might have been a consequence of law enforcement expanding the statute of limitations on the case. The friends she told about the hijacking did eventually get in touch with the FBI, but it seems the agency didn't see much in the theory. Dayton, who was an enthusiastic smoker, died at age 76 from lung disease. Another suspect was a man named John List. List killed his wife, mother, and three children not long before the hijacking went down. The family was broke, but List said the main reason for the slayings was the fact that they distanced themselves from their religious faith. By killing them, he said their souls would get to heaven. Yep, he was nuts. But was he crazy enough to jump out of an airplane with a bag of money and a bomb? He looked like the Cooper sketch at the time, and he was the same height, age, and weight as the man they were looking for. There's also the fact that just before the hijacking, he spent $200,000 of his mother's savings all the cash he had in the world. On top of this, he was a war veteran. The story gets even better when you hear that after he committed those awful murders, he stayed on the run for 18 years, getting married again and changing his name. That's why he was one of the main suspects for many years, but when he was eventually caught, he owned up to the murders but said he had nothing to do with the Cooper case. He died in prison age 82 in 2008, and he didn't have any deathbed confessions. Now for our favorite suspect, who was also a dead ringer for D.B. Cooper, Mr. Richard McCoy Jr. In terms of resumes, if you were looking to hire a skyjacker for your new business, this guy's work experience section would impress you greatly. He did two tours in Vietnam, one as a Green Beret helicopter pilot, and later worked for the Utah National Guard. He was even awarded an Army's Commendation Medal for Heroism, a Purple Heart, and the Distinguished Flying Cross for a rescue he did. This guy really was an action hero. In the hobbies section under his resume, you'd have seen Avid Skydiver. We mean this guy was just perfect. He ticked all the boxes, and then when you learned that prior to the hijacking he'd often talk to Special Forces buddies about doing such a thing, well, Mr. McCoy Jr. really looks like he could have been the infamous Cooper. And get this, on April 7, 1972, he hijacked a plane and asked for $500,000 in ransom money. He'd also asked for four parachutes, the plane was a 727, and McCoy used the stairs for his jump. He got the cash and the chutes at San Francisco International Airport and then flew to Utah. On the way he jumped, but not before leaving his fingerprints everywhere. That buddy of his, who we'll call the worst friend in the world, watched the news on TV and thought, huh, that sounds like the plan my old friend Richard had. He told the cops and soon they were at McCoy's house. 
where they found all the cash in the attic minus 20 bucks that McCoy had spent on some food. His fingerprints were also a match for those found on a magazine on the plane. He was sentenced to 45 years, but after fashioning a fake gun on a dental paste a couple of years later, he and a bunch of other inmates escaped. A few months later, he ran into some FBI agents, and after opening fire on them, one agent shot him dead. The agent later said, When I shot Richard McCoy, I shot D.B. Cooper at the same time. Nonetheless, after an investigation, the authorities said that McCoy was actually much more skilled than Cooper, and so that meant he couldn't have been Cooper. For instance, McCoy was way savvier when it came to knowing when to jump and what flying state the plane should be in. He also knew to wear a helmet and jumpsuit, something of great importance when it comes to surviving a jump from a commercial aircraft. McCoy had been desperate, that's for sure. He wanted to work for the FBI or CIA, but that never came to fruition. The meager wage he did get hardly paid the bills, and his wife at the time of the hijackings was threatening to leave him. The official report stated that McCoy was not D.B. Cooper, but many years later some people involved, including a former FBI agent, said that McCoy certainly was Cooper, but there had never been enough evidence to prove it. He said the skyjacking was no copycat crime, it was a repeat, from a man who learned a few things after the first time. Later, McCoy's family said that the Brigham Young University tie clip found in the Cooper hijacking had belonged to McCoy, a former student at that university. But there is some more good evidence that comes from McCoy's former probation officer, who said he'd seen receipts from a Las Vegas gas station that had belonged to McCoy. Those receipts were from Thanksgiving Day on the day after the hijacking, and Vegas was about a day away by car from the Cooper landing zone. What was McCoy, who lived in Utah, doing in Vegas? the place where one can launder a load of money. The probation officer reckons that McCoy lost some of the cash on the jump and then took his chances in Vegas. It's worth noting here that the bag the authorities gave the hijacker didn't even have a zip. It would have been hard to keep the cash inside while flying through the sky, but then why didn't those bills turn up someplace? When McCoy was questioned about his whereabouts on the night of the hijacking, he'd first lied, saying he was home with his family in Utah. Why lie? The authorities have said time and again that any experienced skydiver would not have made that jump into the cold night, just because the more you know about skydiving, the more you would have known that you had about a 50% chance of dying. But McCoy was desperate. He was losing his family, his house, everything. He certainly had a grudge, having risked his life so many times for the USA, and after getting back, receiving little in the way of help. McCoy never denied being Cooper, but never admitted it either. His wife wouldn't talk about it or help with the investigation, and she even filed a lawsuit against the probation officer for writing a book in which she said is to have helped her husband with the crimes. All we'll say is if any of these major suspects were D.B. Cooper, then it most likely was McCoy. He had the ability. He proved that in the second hijacking, he'd been in the right places and he lied about his whereabouts. He also had a big grudge and was desperate for cash. The FBI officially closed its case in 2016, saying if any new evidence turned up, it would open it again. Most, but not all, agents would speculate that Cooper died that night, and because the area where his body landed is so vast and mountainous and covered in lakes and rivers, he and the rest of the things that went out of that plane with him were just never found. Maybe they'll turn up someday. Still, that scenario takes the heat off the FBI, an agency that doesn't like to be embarrassed, an outfit that lost the cigarette butts for God's sake and has spent way more than $200,000 investigating this case over the years. You might think that someone other than some of the folks we've mentioned would have come forward by now, but as it stands, if someone benefited from that cash, they'd better be keeping quiet, even at present. Maybe Cooper is now in his 90s, watching this video on YouTube, chugging away on his e-cig, and if he is, we salute you, gentlemen air pirate. It's not because we endorse the crime, but because you've given us so much to think and talk about. The fact is, Cooper could still be alive, or his confidant certainly could be, and they'd be foolish to tell anyone the truth. Now you need to watch the insane story of Bermuda Triangle's Time Warp Tunnel, or get down with some more mystery with horrifying unsolved internet mysteries.